In November 1968, the city of Los Angeles had a cultural crisis. And we think of 1968 generally as sort of one big cultural crisis in the United States. But in mid-November 1968, Los Angeles had a very, very specific cultural problem. They lost their Frank Sinatra. And in Los Angeles, Frank Sinatra announced the smog and polluted air were hurting his singing voice, and so he was leaving town. He said he had had it with Hollywood in Los Angeles, that the smog was so bad he had to see his throat doctor three times a week, and so he was selling his house and moving out into the desert to Palm Springs. Sinatra will be 53 next month, and he said, my nose and throat are affected by the smog. I haven't got too many years of singing left. I have to take care of myself. I'm leaving. That was the NBC Nightly News, November 14th, 1968. And if the smog is killing you, it's one thing if you're Frank Sinatra and you can decamp to your desert, o desert oasis in Palm Springs. It's a whole other thing altogether, though, if you are the entire population of the eastern seaboard of the United States. If the smog is killing you, where do you go? Look at this graphic in this next news report. This is so amazing. It's from uh, July 1970. Check out the visuals. Air pollution lay over the eastern seaboard from New York to Atlanta like a pall of yellow-gray fog today for the sixth straight day kept there by hot, humid weather. In New York, Mayor Lindsay put into effect the first stage of a pollution emergency. The sanitation department was ordered to cut incineration by 20%. Hospitals and public housing projects were told to stop burning garbage. Lindsay warned New Yorkers that if things get worse, he'll keep private cars out of some areas of the city. As part of LBJ's Great Society legislation in the 1960s, 1963, uh, Congress had first passed the Clean Air Act. It was the first major anti-pollution legislation in the country. But by the late 1960s, early 1970s, air pollution was so bad, it created a whole new class of emergency in this country. As you just, you just heard in that, in that news report, uh, we were having pollution emergencies in the cities by 1970. The Clean Air Act was first passed in 1963. It was expanded in 1967. Uh, but then in 1970, it was significantly amended to try to take a real bite out of that terrible, terrible air pollution that we were having, in part by saying that cars wouldn't be allowed to pollute as much as they were polluting at the time. Now, Lee Iacocca at that point, he was the executive vice president of the Ford Motor Company in 1970. And when this was all being debated, he told Congress that year that the Clean Air, Clean Air Act of 1970, in his words, would, quote, prevent the continued production of automobiles in the United States. He said the Clean Air Act of 1970 is a, <clears throat> is a threat to the entire American economy and to every person in America. The American Automobile Manufacturers Association also told the Senate that year uh, that that bill would simply end the production of cars in the United States. Manufacturers, quote, would be forced to shut down. Frankly, it's a miracle that there were still American cars by then anyway, since four years earlier, in 1966, when Congress had passed a seatbelt law, uh, Henry Ford II, of yes, that Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford II told Congress in 1966 that if they enacted this new seatbelt law, quote, we'll have to close down. Needless to say, the seatbelt law passed and Ford did not have to close down. They didn't have to close down because of the seatbelts. They didn't have to close down because they had to put in catalytic converters and eventually meet mileage standards. And the Clean Air Act of 1970 did help in terms of terrible air pollution. By the 1980s, though, there were new worries, new worries about a hole in the ozone layer that was being created by a very specific group of chemicals that were then in wide use. Even if that was a scary idea, the ozone layer still was way up there, right? <laughs> way up there somewhere. You couldn't see it. And even though we were worried about that, we also had a much more earthbound concern about something called acid rain. When we talk about the environment, one of the most serious problems is acid rain. Everyone has heard of it. Many may not fully understand it. So Al Roker is going to show us a specific example of what it does. Thanks, Garrick. That's right. In upstate New York, one area has recently been identified as a particularly tragic example of the effects of acid rain. In the Adirondacks, acid rain is more than some vague environmental catchphrase. Indian Lake. Nestled in the Moose River Plain of New York's Adirondack Park, it looks beautiful and serene, 
picture postcard perfect. However, Indian Lake is dead. Indian Lake is not an isolated example. Over a quarter of the 2,700 lakes and ponds in the Adirondack Park, a preserve as big as Vermont, are so acidic they can no longer support fish life. They too are dying. It isn't just the lakes that are being killed by acid rain, it's the forests as well. That was the national treasure that is Al Roker uh, doing that report on the Today Show in 1988. That was July of 1988. And at that time, the other thing going on in the country was, of course, that the 1988 presidential election was in full swing. That was the year that the Republican candidate was Vice President George H.W. Bush. The Democratic candidate uh, was Michael Dukakis before we got the rule about politicians wearing headgear. George H.W. Bush, of course, won the 1988 presidential election in pretty much a landslide. But as part of his campaign for the presidency, he promised to do something about the terrible problem we were having uh, with the ozone layer and the, the dead lakes and acid rain and all the rest of it. After he was elected as president, George H.W. Bush made good on his campaign promise, and he proposed amending the Clean Air Act once more. I mean, they knew what the problem was. With the ozone layer, they knew what was causing the ozone layer to go away. They knew which chemicals had to be eliminated in order to stop making that problem worse and start fixing it on acid rain. They knew that they needed to get rid of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. There was no mystery as to the impact of the problem or what was causing the problem. They just needed to summon the will and the way to get rid of those things. And just like every other time there had been some advance against pollution, there were critics who said, don't do it. We desperately need to keep doing this pollution. If you try to get rid of this pollution, the world will end. In the case of Congressman Bill Dannemeyer at the time, he said the world might not end if you got rid of this pollution, because if you believe in protecting the environment, you then obviously do not believe in God, and therefore heaven will be prevented from solving our problems for us. For we Americans to understand the political clout and influence of the environmental party, we have to understand its theology. And the, the environmental party in American politics today essentially believes that what you see in this world is all there is and all that ever will be. As an institution or a force, it does not believe in a hereafter. And the hereafter will help, maybe. Congressman Bill Dannemeyer arguing that efforts to stop pollution are effectively inherently godless. Obviously, that leads to the, to the next line of attack, which is that they're also obviously therefore communist. And the irony of it is that when the Eastern Bloc countries, the Soviet Union and communist countries in Eastern Europe are moving away from centralized planning, this very act that we're about to take up on the floor, the Clean Air Act amendments, moves America in the direction precisely where the communist system wants to lead. This Clean Air Act's unduly stringent and extremely costly provisions could seriously threaten our nation's economic expansion. The bill that's before this Senate, the so-called Clean Air Act of 1990, in my opinion, will be able to uh, will be able to put this country in a regulatory recession all on its own right because of the lack of productivity the lack of competitiveness that we will generate and find from our american economy that was all 1990 during the debate over what George H.W. Bush said he wanted to do with the Clean Air Act. And despite those predictions that the sky would fall and God would have his revenge, the George H.W. Bush administration passed the amendment to the Clean Air Act, and it took those giant and ultimately effective steps towards stopping acid rain and repairing the hole in the ozone layer. And we didn't become a communist country. They said the sky would fall. Quite the opposite. The ozone layer got better. In 1963, and then in 1967, and then in 1970, and in 1972, and in 1977, up through 1990, that debate and beyond, we have over and over and over again 
made progress on these issues. We've had bipartisan votes and bipartisan support for attacking pollution as we have run into pollution problems and the science has been conclusive about how to fix those problems. And yes, there have been little chicken littles all along the way saying that it would be the end of the world if we try to stop this current round of pollution. But the chicken littles have been wrong all along. And so they make their arguments, but those arguments time and again get proven to be wrong. Today in Washington, the EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, she cited that long history of how people argue against fixing pollution problems when she announced major new limits on emissions from power plants. In the 60s, when smog choked our cities, critics cried wolf and said EPA action would to put the brakes on the, on the auto production. And they were wrong. Instead, our air got cleaner and our kids got healthier and we sold more cars. In the 1990s, critics cried wolf and said fighting acid rain would make electricity go, bit, go up and our lights go out. They said industry would, and I quote, die a quiet death. Well, they were wrong again. Industry is alive and well. Our lights are still on, and we have dramatically reduced acid rain. So time after time, when science pointed to health risks, special interests cried wolf to protect their own agenda, not the agenda of the American people. And time after time, we followed the science, we protected the American people, and the doomsday predictions never came true. Since the Clean Air Act was first passed in 1963, there's been a long history of bipartisan support in Congress, bipartisan votes in Congress to handle pollution issues. But today's limits, the announced limits today on pollution from power plants, these ones today were not subject to a vote in Congress. The EPA announced these changes today under their own authority as an agency. In a 2007 ruling, the Supreme Court held that the Clean Air Act was unambiguous, that as a law, the Clean Air Act requires the government to act to keep the air clean. <laughs> and when there are pollutants in the air that represent a danger to human life and human health, the government has a statutory legal responsibility to act to limit that pollution. And in 2007, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that that unequivocally and unambiguously included the kind of greenhouse gases that come from tailpipe emissions and that come from power plants. One of my favorite stories to ever emerge out of the George W. Bush administration. One of the stories about that presidency that seems so crazy, you think it's apocryphal, but no, really, it really happened. I'm not kidding. One of my favorite George W. Bush administration stories was the story of how that administration reacted to that Supreme Court ruling in 2007. So the Supreme Court rules that EPA has to regulate air pollution and that the EPA has to. They're required by law to determine whether or not greenhouse gases are air pollution. If so, the EPA has to regulate them. The EPA under George W. Bush, they did what the court asked. You got to, it's the Supreme Court, right? They did what the Supreme Court asked, said, okay, fine, yes. We acknowledge as the EPA, greenhouse gases are air pollution. We're in charge of regulating air pollution. And so, yes, we, we do have to regulate them. They were ordered to come up with a finding on that issue. They came up with a finding on that issue. And then they emailed that finding to the White House. And the George W. Bush White House refused to open the email. Literally, they said they wouldn't click on it. So technically, they were never required to act because they never heard what the EPA decided on this issue because they literally decided that they would not open the email that contained the finding. Thus, they had not been notified of the finding. Thus, no requirement to act. Ta-da! What's the opposite of like father, like son? Does that have an opposite <laughs> as an idiom? Well, under the Obama administration, they apparently opened their email. Uh, they recalibrated the spam filter or whatever. And the EPA, as it is legally required to do so uh, by statute and by rulings of the Supreme Court, the EPA has now issued these new standards. The two biggest contributors to greenhouse gases are the kind of pollution that causes climate change. The two biggest contributors are vehicles, tailpipe emissions, and power plants. The Obama administration has now acted aggressively on both of those two sources of pollution.
And as usual, as is the case of every previous advance in this field in our nation over the last 50 years, critics are now saying that we need actually to keep all this pollution. We can't get rid of this pollution. These efforts to get rid of this pollution will destroy the American economy. Senator Mitch McConnell today put out a statement calling these new rules a dagger in the heart of the middle class. Critics have always made arguments like this about trying to control pollution. It's, it's this odd form of hysteria that is totally predictable. You can set your watch to it. How have those critics been defeated in the past at junctures like this? Will President Obama and the EPA be able to defeat them this time too? Stay with us.